Sorry, we're starting live. Uh, hi, <laughs> it is live. It's exactly what it is. It we is mess live. things up. <laughs> it's the live stream, everybody. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our weekly live stream. I'm Megan Quick. Hi, Matt. Hi, George. How are you guys doing today? Wonderful. All right. How are you? Beautiful October day here in New York. So I really enjoying it. Gorgeous October day. I feel like we were flirting with the colder weather, but we're kind of back to a little more like light sweater weather. And I'm always yes. happy about that. <laughs> um, everyone, before we dive into our stream today, I wanted to thank regular viewers for being here. You're our, you're just our reason for being. That's what I'll say. Um, <laughs> and also, if you're new, uh, we are Valiant Technology. We are a managed service provider. We're based in New York, but we do have a national reach. You can follow us on YouTube, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and you can comment on our videos. And actually, the Matt, if I'm correct, the comments will show up. Um, yeah, if you leave comments on LinkedIn, Facebook, I think it's LinkedIn, Facebook, and who am I thinking of? I'm not thinking of LinkedIn and Facebook. We'll just say okay. LinkedIn and Facebook today. And YouTube and, directly. And, 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 and Friendster and MySpace. I think if you leave <laughs> comments there, they'll come up yeah. for us. Just they'll come up in 2002. Angel yeah. Fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I know my <laughs> visit us at GeoCities today. Yes. Yeah, please do. Um, we need a counter. Anyway, sorry, yeah. Megan. Please go. <laughs> it's okay. Um, all right. So um on that note, we've got a really great subject today. It's it's part of our cybersecurity best practices for small businesses. We talk about this stuff a lot, but today we kind of correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but we want to just sort of take a microscope onto some basic cybersecurity building blocks cut through some of the noise because cybersecurity is a huge like tentacled topic and there are things that everybody can do to protect themselves and we sort of want to focus on those today absolutely um, absolutely um right. in fact like in in some of the notes for today's episode i i kind of put like a i don't know if it was personal i mean i said i was pondering and i guess that doesn't really mean much other than Full just person. kind of thinking. I was I was thinking kind of like uh, uh, Winnie the Pooh would ponder, you know, just kind of like walking through my house. I had the big jar of honey. I sat honey. down. Was it, oh, I got to get stuck in it. Then you're fine. <laughs> That's why all your computers are broken right now. Very you're sticky. Oh, the keys aren't working. But, uh, you know, I was sitting down thinking about cybersecurity because it is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's something that's core to everything that we do. Um, it's something that the larger IT services community is concentrating on a lot right now. And I think as an employee of a company like Valiant, I personally was hit with an absolute tidal wave of cybersecurity content. And that's, that's, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, but it can be overwhelming. Sometimes it's too much. Yeah. So yeah, today we're going to talk about three, three items, three things that you can do within your business to help improve your security. And you know, um, I also talked about having tons of resources today, checklists and guides and all this other stuff. Yeah, no, it's not happening. It's not not happening because I didn't do it. It's because I'm going to pace it out better. Yeah, I don't want to have like 50 different resources show up and then them become overwhelming because I found myself becoming overwhelmed just preparing them, you know. Um, so today we're going to release the new version of our password best practices checklist at the end of this episode. And uh, each month, or I'm sorry, not each month, each week, we're gonna start adding a little bit more security related content to the streams. That way it's a consistent flow of really valuable information as opposed to like 50 things quick hit, you forget about them next week and then turn around and wonder what happened. Yeah, you know? I think it's really important. As if when we were preparing for this, we were talking about weaving security into every aspect of our uh, conversations or, uh, or, or what we do day in, day out, because, um, you know, for so long as a practitioner here for a long time in, in this, in this field, uh, security really was an afterthought for a long time. It was like, get it done. We'll worry about it in post kind of attitude. And it's really not. Yeah, get, get, get the engine running. We'll worry about the seat belts and the airbag later on. Exactly. It's, it's a, yeah, you, you wouldn't build a car without, you know, tires, but sometimes at times yeah. you've done that. But uh, before we dive into the episode, I really want to say uh, last week I was uh, at the WorldCom event uh, with one. Uh, we were introduced to those folks from our, one of our great uh, 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 partners and customer, uh, Lisky PR. Uh, thanks for WorldCom for letting us be part of your event. Um, but I want to say thank you to Dan Comas from TechRunner who stood in and, and joined us. And uh, Dan's a great guy uh, and super knowledgeable. And I really appreciate him uh, standing in for and, and just being part of our live stream. So it was really exciting. So 
that's uh that's that's one another small announcement. And the other piece is um, <laughs> Justin, uh, our CIO, is uh, he's fine. Uh, he's just really busy. Yes. We, we've we've had uh, an unbelievable amount of just work come in uh, as uh, once again part of the cybersecurity initiatives and just uh, to see the overall growth of where we uh, where our customers are. Um, so uh, Justin's has been a like, super swamped, and you know when, when we talked about it, we decided hey we'll take, we'll take a little pause on him joining our live streams. He'll be here next year, and uh, you know I think I think it's it's good just to acknowledge that. Uh, he didn't disappear off the face here. It wasn't written off the episode. It wasn't some kind of weird um, <laughs> yeah. mid-season replacement. So yeah, uh, no don't worry. Really exciting <laughs> in the cast or anything. But, yeah. <laughs> really quickly before we get started, and it's it's funny we're already at six minutes today because we get we got so many things to chat about. But uh, you know, Megan, you've been mentioning that you can now watch the stream via Twitter in our Twitter account at the Valiant Way. Is it at the Valiant Way? And. Interestingly enough, some of the outreach questioning where Justin's been for the past few weeks came to my personal Twitter account after that. So I don't know if that's, that's that I, 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 I feel, a little, I, you know, being 40 and all, I think I'm not as hip as any as I used to be. But I You're think not. people were sliding. I think that people were sliding into my DMs for Justin. <laughs> Maybe it's not, it's not is that what that is? I think, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Often say he's the smartest guy. He's the smartest guy in the room. Yeah, and I, I think mean, people can tell, and they're like, "Where's that? Where's that expert?" <laughs> where's that, exactly. Where's that, where's that teddy bear of an expert? So, well, uh, you know, just to get us going into cybersecurity, this is something that Justin actually gave me a hand with last week when we were um, doing some work related to um, a, a piece of news from a, a news agency, and that kicked off some of the content that we're going to go through today. So let's just let's roll right into it. So. Yeah, we can just kick it off. Um, I think starting off with best practices, what are they? Why do they matter? Um, that's something I always bring up in calls I have with prospective clients. Um, so by definition, um, a best practice is a procedure that has been shown by research and experience to produce optimal results and proposed as a standard suitable for widespread adoption. Um, now, to say that in a more human way. Uh, <laughs> the things we do because they lead to proven outcomes or simply it's the right thing to do. Like right. covering your mouth when you cough um, or maybe wearing a mask on a subway. I don't know. I think I agree with that. That's practice. I feel better when I, see it. when I see the car full of masked folks, I feel better about being in, in, in a metal tube with them, so. Yeah, or, or I feel better about maybe one person at the end not doing it, but I'm like, you know what? The Pretty compliance far, right? is overwhelming. Exactly. So, yeah, on that note, that kind of sets the stage. How, George, how does that translate to cybersecurity? So I think, I think one thing we should always, I think, I think always kind of bring it back to a, a best practice or framework or, 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 or just a, just a uh, mindset, I think, is the CIA triad. Mm -hmm. And for us to kind of say it again, I think it's a really important thing. CIA triad is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of the cornerstones of most cybersecurity best practices or frameworks. Uh, they go very much hand in hand. And the idea is that, um, you know, you want to be able to say this data is secured and private. People who don't have access to it shouldn't have access to it. The idea here that um, when I open up uh, an accounting ledger, that data is accurate, it hasn't been tampered with, it's not repudiated, it hasn't been changed, it's, it's, it's accurate. And the last part is when I need access to my data, I can gain access to it right now when I need it. And I think that all of our security and best practices kind of touch on each piece of the CII triad, but they kind of, I think they kind of fall into sections that are more uh, heavily, weighted more heavily into each piece of it. So. Let's, let's dive right in and start talking about one that is really important, which is the um, confidentiality aspect of it, or, or more directly tied to confidentiality, which is passwords. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Oh, sorry, Megan, go ahead. No, no, you go, Matt. You're good. I was going to say, you know, the number of passwords that we all have is is staggering. Last week or the week before, George and I were recording some stuff for the, the WorldCom event that he mentioned earlier. And I think he said he had like something like 200 passwords. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, 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 go ahead, keep talking, keep talking. And then I went home and I started really thinking about some of what I have, you know, and it's not just the passwords for the accounts that I use on a daily basis here or at home. It's not my Amazon account. It's stuff that I've created ever since I've had the ability to create an account online. You know, it's, it's the Macy's.com account I've probably had since like 2001. It's, 
you know, um, a CD baby account for buying old indie CDs that I probably haven't even logged into for 15 years. It's still there. That and one. there's yeah. a good chance it's using an insecure password because 15 years ago, we were not thinking in these terms. You, you might have used one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm well, I did the baseballs route. I did. I put an exclamation point at the end of it. Oh, okay. But, well, I know. This, you unlocked it. Unlocked that's, it. that's really worrying to me because I, I mean, not to. I, I was a child when the internet was like really going when it started. And I I don't know what I put out there. In the, like, but luckily, I had a weird brain as a kid. So I don't even know. Maybe the passwords are still <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, So I guess what I'm getting down to is we do have a lot of passwords. And having yeah. strong passwords is critical. But so is taking a moment to, again, go back to that whole pondering thing I've been doing lately. And really just think back to what it is that you've had created over the... Mm -hmm your internet lifetime. I don't know what to call it. Uh, yeah. The entire time you've had the ability to do things online uh, from day one, you've probably created an email account or something. And yeah. from that point on, you've been amassing passwords, most likely without realizing it. Well, yeah. and, that, and that's where it gets right. You know, if you want to step back for a second from a, this, this uh, mindset is that, you know, one part of your password is really well known almost, almost automatically, which is your email address. So you're taking away 50% of the differentiator for yeah. the for the access. Oh, 50 percent of you user account information yeah Correct. absolutely right sorry but that, that might be that i probably said it wrong but like you know it's really easy to kind of uh you know there's only so many uh especially if you're a corporate account which uses almost almost always a variation on your name and mm -hmm. so much of your so many of your you know your, in your business life is using your corporate or your you know your your, your business identity mm -hmm. and so you know so if you think that that's that's a, that's a known factor People know that, right? or they can guess it really easily. Right. Um, I, most of us who are uh, more forward-facing in our organizations, our email password, our, our email is public. It's a, you can find any one of our emails online in about four right. seconds. And we have to be accessible, you know, like as Correct. sales and marketing. Like, it's, 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 right. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it being public is irrelevant because there's a good chance it's going to be one one of four things. Your first name only, if you're in an early position in a, in a company. Yes. Uh, first name dot last name. First initial, last name, or first name, last initial. Those right. are like the four most common, common permutations yeah. mm -hmm. of, a, of an email address. So you've got that right there. So if I know your name's George Dowderman, I've got four really good chances to know at least what your login is going to be as far as the username portion. Not the password, you know, but the first step in the first process. First step in the process. You know, it's like the classic mm -hmm. attack on a server or a system. I'm going to try admin. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. don't change that, or it's, uh, so it's 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 just been really common. And I think that you know, and once again, especially going back a little bit back in time, um, we people mostly use like you know eight character passwords that were easy to remember, common dictionary words, things that were like you could just say it out loud. You know, it was yeah, really common, common dictionary years words. Ago, they changed. The common dictionary words in the in the worst one was always delete speak, where it's like I'm going to replace all e's with threes and an l with a seven. If yeah. you can do that in your head on the fly, so can a machine. Period. But it might I mean, I, I, I yeah, it might already I be. A, <laughs> look, I wrote a text translation function back when I was like 16 that did it for writing dumb crap in AOL chat. But the fact is, is that it would you type into your text box, the window was subclassed, it would grab your text, it would run a function against it to make it lead speak, and it would send it to chat instantly. Instantly. It must, it must it's so not you're not adding an extra step to the machines, you're just making them laugh at you. <laughs> right. right. So, I I do like the the sort of advent of passphrases as right. sort of a, a evolution because and also this is an important reason not to participate in those data mining things where right. mm -hmm. put the lyrics to your favorite song. Guess what? The lyrics to your favorite song could be a really good passphrase for you. Correct. Because people can't guess your favorite lyric, so don't put it out on the internet. Don't do it. But, Correct. You know, now, Megan, now that I'm going to I'm going to assume that you do that and the next time I'm here at the office, I'm going to like be like trying to like recite the chorus from that Chumba Wumba song because I know that's your favorite song. <laughs> this is whiskey drink. <laughs> and then I'm going to get into your account. Tub something. <laughs> Thank you. Tub something. Exactly. <laughs> that's the song. It's tub something. Um, so yes. Yeah. Um, so so just kind of Bring us back a little bit more gently. Um, it's really important to have a really long multi-character, yes. and, and you know the minimum minimum today is uh, twelve. We really recommend sixteen. Uh, and honestly, uh, it's very but just really to as a as a caveat to that that the twelve is generally acceptable when the password's been generated by a computer at random. Correct. 
16 if you're a person coming up with with the password. Pass, that's really the way to look at it. Right. That's, that's, that's actually a really great um, that's a really great way to put it. So, you know, um, passphrases are string, strings of words that may be jumbo words, maybe non non words, they may be replacements. Um, there's a whole bunch of things in there about cheeseburgers, you know, whatever you like to do. Um, or, no, the, 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 yeah, the example I have here is a passphrase. Passphrase is cheeseburger hold the tomato thanks with an exclamation point at the end. That's not terrible. That's quite a, that's quite not a terrible. phrase to have. And you, it's easy to remember, but also it can be, ju yeah, just specific mm -hmm. enough to you. And, yeah, and that's think, not going to be a dictionary attack vulnerable uh, passphrase right there by any means. No, and also if you, and it's a, if, you, if you also use a nonsense word in there in the middle, where it's, so there's a lot of that. But really, quite honestly, the better thing to do is to have machine generated passwords that are really long, 30 characters, and use a password manager. Right. And have, and then couple that with multi factor authentication. So right. just, I, I'm sure every single people, almost everyone's watching this is probably nauseous hearing the word multi factor. Yeah. Um, I, you, it, you know, it's not a panacea. It doesn't solve all problems, but it's a really solid thing you can do for your for your protect your identity and protect your access. Mm -hmm. um, just briefly, what it is is the best way and the best example that I've seen, and I just use it all the time. It's think of your ATM card. Um, mm -hmm. you, you can't go to the ATM without the card and the pin. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is that the uh, multi-factor authentication is something you know and something you have. The have is the card, and something you know is the pin. So uh, generally speaking, a lot of times you'll see it used as either SMS message that comes in, less secure, but better than better than nothing. Right. Better would be a time-based one-time password, Google Authenticator, Duo, by Cisco. There's a bunch of great ones out there, uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Authenticator. And then there's also another thing called a hardware token, which is kind of like the ultimate way of doing it. Uh, there's some really good ones out there by a company called YubiKey. Uh, if someone's interested, I could definitely do a deep dive with you on that, um, because it's really interesting. And, uh, oh, we had a delivery. <laughs> oh, no, we have a, we have a gene here. Hey, it's Gene. No? Okay. Gene's going on camera. Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah. He, 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 I think he's running into a meeting. Um, yes. But that was a nice surprise just to look up and see Gene. I haven't seen him. Like, what the heck? So um, <laughs> anyway, it, it's a great, it's, it's a multi-factor is a great, is a single simplest and best thing you can do to protect your accounts, to protect, to protect, your, um, protect your identity. Um, it should be on for all of your uh, key services. I really, we, we, we highly and strongly endure, uh, recommend that everyone, especially for their Microsoft 365 and our Google Workspaces accounts, those are uh, accounts that are used for a lot of authentication purposes and they are access to your other accounts because you have you know, email, password, kind of combo. Yeah. So and I want to, I want to take yeah. that just once. I'm sorry. I'm, I know I'm oh, interrupting right. a lot today. I've got lots of ideas, all that pondering. Um, one thing is, you know, we do, we do a lot of work with marketing and communications firms and PR firms. And a lot of the work that goes on these days happens on social media. And it's so critical to protect your Facebook and your Instagram and your LinkedIn accounts, especially because a lot of them are going to be tied to systems you use for work. Correct. For example, yeah. my Facebook account is tied to our HubSpot account for posting purposes. Mm -hmm. If something happens to my account, I'm not posting anything on our behalf until Correct. it gets resolved. Um, so there's the personal identity issue. There's the problem at work that can be caused. And because of that, we're definitely going to put together a guide for securing all of the mainstream social media networks. Really? Especially yeah. Especially to our customers. Especially to our customers. Really critical. And, and you know, just uh, there's been definitely instances where... Uh, a, a, a breach has occurred of a social media account from mm -hmm. an outside agency who had delegated access. So we exactly. really want, we really want, we really want to protect those. So I think that's, I think, you know, I said we could talk for hours on this, but I think we need to move along for we the interest of yeah. time. So. Well, and I, we're going to move on. We're going to move the dial to the availability um, part of the CIA triad. And to narrow that down, we're going to talk about regular patching and hardware and software maintenance. Um, and luckily, I've got you and uh, George. You got you and Matt on here to talk more in depth about this. But yeah, this yeah. is a huge. It's this is this like Sisyphean, like pushing the rock up the hill. It never ends. But you also can't stop doing. Well, yeah. I, if you if you support Windows systems every Tuesday, every Tuesday, well, second Tuesday of every month, the, ro the rocks rolling right back down on you. <laughs> um, I mean, that's literally the case because you're updating, you know, that's the kind of the fabled, uh, infamous, maybe better way of looking at Patch Tuesday. Um, 
Please make yourself. I, happy. I get like a little pain in my stomach hearing you even say Patch yeah. Tuesday. That's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah at least you know you you anticipated it every month. You knew it was coming. You know, at least it's better than it used to be. Is Windows Update has mm-hmm. been around for a long time. Uh, was in Windows ninety eight. If you remember, if uh, for our our, long, our, old, our more uh, seasoned veteran listeners or watchers mm-hmm. viewers. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, m- many of the times when Matt and I were kind of grousing, sharing home. You know. I, 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 yeah, I don't know what the right word was. It was it was conversation. It wasn't the most joyful given the topic, but yeah. you know, it, it's something that we've run into many times over the years. The need to daisy chain the updates in a particular order so that you didn't right. crash your machine and have to completely reinstall it. Um, I personally have taken very important machines down in the past with a bad Windows update. I think anyone that has before automation tools and RMM tools came into play has a story about this. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it's it, painful. And if it's painful for us, it's going to be painful for other people that don't do this on a regular basis. Well, and that's I, when the vulnerabilities come in. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and I wanted to maybe just for, I think um, we probably have a pretty IT savvy audience, but maybe a quick sort of like, why does patching have to be done? Great. Like, what is the fundamental? That's thing you're making for bringing us back, to, yeah, okay. back to Earth. But that's really important. Was, mm-hmm. So patching is how machine uh, vulnerabilities, issues, flaws in, in the system, operating system or hardware, depending on what the patch is, it could be both or depending on what, uh, you know, uh, get fixed. So um, when we read a lot of uh, most, like a good example with the Colonial Pipeline hack, mm. uh, that was a result of an unpatched Windows uh, exchange server, mm-hmm. uh, mail server. Um, it was out on the internet. It has an exposure through its, uh, probably our, our, its uh, web outlook, web access, o- OWA. Uh, mm-hmm. it was, you know, it had a vulnerability, it wasn't patched for whatever reason. Um, and, and, and I think it's really important to put in that patching is really hard. It's a, it's a table stake thing that people talk about, but I, 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 I challenge anyone to say that they're hundred percent patched. It's a lie. It's impossible. Yeah. It's, really it's, not, it's, not, it's not only impossible or, or very difficult to achieve complete, um, patch status on something, but. It, it, it's also once you hit that, it's not going to stick there in that long because look, everything we do is on the internet. Everything happens so much faster nowadays than right. it used to. And I, like, think about it this way: to deposit a check, you used to have to go down to the bank or the ATM, talk to a person, do whatever. Now you just take a photo of your check with your cell phone. Um, that that increase in speed and convenience is also an increase in speed as to how quickly it is to figure out how to take advantage of a system. And, and I think uh, a lot, you know, there's a lot of there's bug bounties out there. There's people constantly mm-hmm. looking. And I mean, there's attackers who are literally looking. There's internal research teams. There's researchers. There's bug hunters out there. So people are always looking for vulnerabilities. And, and unfortunately, there's, there's so many common vulnerabilities that are unpatched that are accesses. And, and I think the bigger danger is what may be an unpatched system of an unimportant system, like, like a you know low level, not not critical to the business, is used as a jump off point for what's called a lateral attack. I get into a network through a low level a system, IoT device, uh, you name it. People are probing and they're looking. Yeah, and that's that's well, that's that's their job. If you think yeah. about it that way, absolutely. And the answer is just to have a cadence to it, right? The answer is just to never quite stop. <laughs> well, <laughs> never well, that that cadence is is. I mean, anything that you do in a real irregular cadence is going to be something that's mostly like can't get the words that most likely going to be a healthy activity. If you exercise on a regular basis, you're probably going to feel better. If you don't skip meals and eat at a, at a a consistent rate, your, your blood sugar and everything else is going to function properly. It's, it's exactly the same idea. And um, you know, this is where I think that especially this time of year with cybersecurity awareness month, you hear a lot of people say, you know, you're never too small of a target and you really aren't. And if you're that two person company and you've got a couple of machines and you don't think anything's going to happen, you are literally a beautiful target because you're going to be the unsuspecting target. And I could care less about what's on your machine. I just want to get on it. So that's where I can originate my attack from. Correct. That's it. Correct. It's, it, 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 it might just be used as a DDoS attack against Microsoft mm-hmm. or recently mitigated a massive attack against Azure. Um, and it's really interesting that almost uh, university systems, not university, but generally speaking, a lot of those systems probably were from an unpatched uh, vector attack. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so um, all right, thank you guys. it's backup yeah. time. Yes, that, <laughs> that's the best transition I've ever heard. All right, Matt, <laughs> talk about and testing. things go. Yeah, I mean, look, things go wrong. Hardware fails. 
Um, electrical problems happen. I've had machines get completely fried out of out of thin air before and not been able to, you know, bring them back up terribly quickly. And those those things just happen, you know. And uh, backups are are the best way to be able to recover from so many incidents, whether they be related to a hardware failure, a human error, a cybersecurity incident. It gives you the ability to turn back the clock. And you know, unfortunately, right now we've got all these uh, the ships out on the west coast waiting uh, to make their way to harbors. So you know can't exactly get a flux capacitor that easily these days and just, you know, right. hit 88 miles an hour. Uh, so your real alternative is to have good backups at the ready. And I, I, I got some notes here because I have a personal experience that I'll share that's still kind of, I've woken up a couple of times over the past 20 years <laughs> to live a nightmare related to this, you know? I think the big question a lot of people ask is what is, what makes a good backup? And I think the number one thing is making sure that you're backing up the data that you actually want to back up. And right. you can't do that unless you know where your information is. You can't protect something unless you know it exists. So yes. that is always the number one kind of like step to having a good backup. Yeah. Uh, just like the just like the patching, having a regular cadence for your backups is incre incredibly important. And what that, that cadence is determined by the type of work that you're doing. Um, sure. Some people, it's great to have a weekly backup. I would never do that for anyone at this point. I think that daily is a minimum. And then you do multiple times per day, depending on how much data churn is going on in your business. And that just means how how often data is being changed to the point where it should be backed up. I mean, that's the easiest right. way to put that. And um, it, it, there's some technical terms that we can go to RPO and RTO and repo. Yeah, it's another, that's not important that's today. It's more, this is, this is the basics. Like it's mm -hmm. how how much time, the question you had to ask yourself is what do I need and how long do I need to, how long can I go without it? Mm, yeah, that's a really, as a, those are the two like factors that are critically important. Like, you know, how, what is it? Do I need it? How long can I go without it? Now you could say, yeah, I, I, yeah. I was going to say, ahead. I think that let, let's cover RTO and RPO in a future episode, maybe um, for November is that's going to be all about prepping for 2022. Perfect. That's, that's great. And, and, you know, it, it will re, we will revisit our, our downtime calculator as well, because RTO and RPO are, are, are critical. But in this case, we're really just talking about how often you're backing up. And this is, at the end of the day, this can be more of a gut check than a, than a, than a formula. And uh, equally important is how long you retain backups. How long do you keep those backups around before they either get completely deleted to make space or rotated if you're using some kind of physical media, which is not really terribly advised these days, but still needs to be considered. Yeah. And uh, I'll explain to you why right now. And I'll try and keep it quick because I know we're running late, uh, long today. Uh, back at my first job, I had to uh, bring my first exchange server up and that was a lot of fun. It was exchange 2000, uh, everything went well, eventually moved up to exchange 2003, it had this brand new gorgeous, I think it was a compact per line right then. It wasn't even bought by HP yet, it was a compact. And um, I loved my compacts, man. I look at them, the RAID array, I'd always have like a RAID, was it um, RAID 5 plus a hot spare in there? And I'd be, I'd be the idiot that would go up to someone and be like, watch this and just pull a hard drive out of a machine and show them that I kept running just to prove how nice and redundant everything was. God, I'll never do that again. Um, but anyway, <laughs> one day my, my brand new recently upgraded Exchange 2003 server flat out failed. There was a failure in the motherboard that caused a short in the back plane for the RAID array and that fried all the drives. Oh my so gosh. there was a chain reaction in the machine. Um, it wasn't something related to the environment. It wasn't, you know, a humidity situation or temperature or, or, or anything like that. Bear with me. I'm trying to get a link up so that we can share some stuff with people here. Um, you know, everything that was in this episode about designing a, net, a healthy network computing environment uh, was, was absolutely followed. It was just bad luck. Piece of hardware fell apart. Right. Which um, so, you know, my buddy Rob Dixon over at CDW, he's been a friend for over two decades now takes care of me. I've got a brand new server in my office the next morning. I've got the drives. I've got everything I need. I reinstall I install the machine. I get Exchange on there as a base version, figuring, great, I'm just going to overwrite everything with my backup, get my tapes out. We're using a VXA autoloader at the time. I load them <laughs> in, with tiny little tapes, and everything's, you know, you're hearing like the <laughs> sound of all the, the tapes kind of like bouncing around the machine, and then the uh, restore failed. The day before, I received a report from Backup Exec that my verification passed. So now the question is, why is it that piece of software is telling me it's fine, but in reality, it clearly isn't because no one's going to be able to get to their email for some time until I find the previous week's backup tapes that were stored at a bank in a, in a safe deposit box across the street for the sake of distance and security. Um, got those in, same exact thing happened. So I had two weeks of backups that were being done nightly and verified as being correct that 
at the end of the day didn't exist. And um, after having my little freak out running around the office, trying to like try to like burn off energy, get back to the little pondering thing, have a protein shake, whatever it was, I realized that I was able to use some log files from Exchange and replay them. And that's how I managed to get that machine back up and running. And by the end of the day, we were perfectly fine. But the backups that I trusted, that I took yeah. care of, that I maintained, that I rotated and had um, some going to Iron Mountain while the others were in the bank across the street at the safe deposit box, all the right steps for the time were being taken. But at the end of the day, I failed because I did not, I trusted the system too much and didn't do any kind of like um, independent random restorations to the network to see if it would actually work with necessary. And uh, look at George's face. I feel like I'm going to get scolded. This was 20 years ago. No, um, no, I, 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 I think that's what I, 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 I probably, I probably had to say. I, 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 I wish I could tell you that I had a different story. Um, that's that's dissimilar to what you're saying. But I just thinking back to a couple of times this happened to myself in my career. Um, yeah. And, and luckily, the backup systems have gotten more reliable. Oh, they're, they're, uh, they're, and they're also based in the cloud, and that 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 changes yeah. so much. You're not dealing with physical media that could be accidentally demagnetized yeah. or damaged or, or, damaged. or, or be cut full, full victim to mold and mildew, depending on what kind of uh, conditions it's in. Yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, uh, just to give a shout out to our partner, Datto. You know, Datto is this great, uh, you know, screenshot verification that the backup is complete. It brings the VM up from the... From the backup, it's really cool mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, if anyone's curious, we could definitely give you a demo of it. Um, but it's better. But once again, it's not one hundred percent. It's part of a yeah. uh, it's part of an overall risk management plan. It's part of a, a, a you know a, a cybersecurity uh, plan to protect your data, protect your assets, and and you know if you don't, it's, it's self preserving due diligence. Correct. If, and, and you know backups are just one component in, a, in an overall business uh, disaster recovery business continuity plan. Uh, they tend to, uh, we talked about this in the past, they tend to get conv convoluted, they're different things, but they're, once again, it's really important. I mean, you have to, you have to back up the data that's important. And I think the other part that's really, really critical here is data in the cloud is not backed up inherently. Right. A lot of people it's think not, it's <laughs> not inherently safer. It's, it's just that they tend, uh, cloud service providers, you know, your Microsoft, your Googles, will have a form of backup to protect the data that they are contractually obligated for. But it's only for a certain number of days. It's only a certain amount of time. And it doesn't necessarily translate to a longer term archive. It doesn't translate into a longer term backup. You know, uh, an accident deletion on day, you know, today's the 21st. And, you know, it's on SharePoint on uh, 1121, that data is gone forever. And it's irrecoverable. Unless you have a cloud-to-cloud -cloud backup or a different plan in, in place to protect right. that. So it's really important. So the, once again, cloud doesn't change fundamentals. It just changes the mechanism which you use do the fundamentals, right? Yeah, I, I love that's a really good way to put that, George. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really good. It's a venue that's, change. It's a venue change. It's just, it's just the, 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 exactly. The, the you got, yeah, you have to reapply the same sort of, yeah, yeah it doesn't resolve yeah. any of that. Yeah. That's why it's really important. If, you know, this, this kind of goes out to our, our you know, younger IT viewers or people starting out in this field or just the fundamentals matter and the best do the, be the, best do the basics better. Mm -hmm. And these are all basic things. Uh, the one thing we didn't put into this best practices was email phishing attacks and business email compromise because it's a, it, that's a whole other topic. Mm -hmm. and, 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 it gets, and that gets really complicated. These are the three things you yeah. should do today. Yes, and and kind of with on that note, George, thank you so much. We we should wrap up, but I wanted to say, like you said, we covered those three basics. They just mm -hmm. scratched the surface. Um, uh, Matt, do you want to put? Up yeah, our let's 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 show this really yeah. quickly. It's it's the first of the the resources we're going to make available rela related to cybersecurity. So that's the link to our cybersecurity best practice checklist, and I'm just going to quickly share my screen so we can take a look at it together. Just give me one moment here. Of course, this is a new Mac, and there are security things I need to click yes on before I can share things. It's, and yeah, I can't yeah, use my privacy. best practice. Look at this. I can't, it's not letting me use my fingerprint. I've got to type in a whole password. It's like 62 characters. Hold on a second. <laughs> We're almost there. Availability. Oh. <laughs> All right, give me, I'm almost there. Let's see if this works. Uh-oh, I can't share my screen because of increased security on this machine. 
I can't I, believe well, it. What, what a strangely um, appropriate way for this stream to end. Um, Seriously. But, but everyone, please. I, I promise you, it's amazing. It's got seven different um, factors that you should be considering when it comes yeah. to um, uh, secure passwords from the length to the complexity to how it's stored to making sure that you don't share it with anyone. That, that was the big one I put in there. I said, you know, trust aside, friends and family are great, but it's not a matter of them having access to your account. It's a matter of them becoming a vulnerability in, in, in a way to access your account by another person. There's a lot of right. little things in there that take like the, the general best practices that are like one liners and really explain the reasoning. And yeah. I think that once you explain the reasoning behind an action, that action becomes so much more logical to take. And less, let, maybe uh, if people understand, they'll just be like, this is why we have to jump through these loops. But thank God mm -hmm. I'm doing it. Um, Absolutely. And, and yeah, we'll have a, we'll, we'll make sure that it's a preview. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? Because people like YouTube, I'm going to do a preview video. We're going to put we'll it up like there so everyone can see it. Love it. That'll be great. All right. And guys, I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, security is an ongoing need and it will continue to be more and more critical. It's gotten so much more critical. Um, and George. Um, yeah. I, I just want to say thanks, yeah. everyone. Uh, if you want looking for more, some more information on this, uh, I was in, is it? very passionate topic for us as a company and me personally. Um, check out the National Cybersecurity Alliance's staysafeonline.org. Has a really great resources for both personal uh, IT security or cybersecurity and, and things you can apply to your business. Unfortunately, uh, the two pieces are overlapping a lot more in this day and age, uh, especially with hybrid remote work, which is a whole other topic we should definitely tackle. Matt, just put it in the hopper. Uh, I feel like we're running out of things to talk about here. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, but uh, it just becomes, uh, it's really great. They have some great, uh, some great resources and it would be really helpful for anyone to uh, just, uh, just kind of provoke some thought. So check it awesome. out. Thank you so much, George. Um, all right, everyone. That's our episode today. Uh, please tune in next week. Uh, you heard the IT joke. It's always DNS. I started hearing it when I came to Valiant. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of honesty to that statement. Uh, so we're going to spend next week explaining what exactly uh, DNS is and what makes it an integral part to everyone's lives and the role of DNS in filtering to add an additional layer of protection to your small business uh, businesses technology. Um, so, guys, I really hope you enjoyed today's stream. Hit that thumbs up. And if you have any questions on any of our or topics you want to see us cover, send it to us. Send a message. Fill out our online form at thevaliantway.com. Um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Oh my goodness. We have so much content. Now. <laughs> I know. It's a lot of stuff. You want, to, you want to be on this YouTube right. channel. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, George. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.